I'd like to now introduce our speaker. We have Elise Parker here today with us. Elise is a PhD candidate in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department at Yale. Elise's work explores how species discovery and description in Antarctic fishes has been revolutionized by the integration of traditional morphological data with next generation DNA sequencing approaches. Her talk today will focus on how changes in hypotheses about Antarctic biodiversity impact our understanding of how Antarctic life evolved across a backdrop of ancient climate change and how investigating these past events helps us to forecast future impacts of climate change on biodiversity. And with that, we will welcome Elise Parker. Thank you so much, Megan, for that introduction, and thank you all for being here today. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Okay. So um, I'm really excited to share with you all today a chapter of my dissertation research that I completed in collaboration with the Peabody Museum, and which is focused on how an integrative approach to species limitation has ushered in a new age of exploration in Antarctic biodiversity. So one of the major goals that evolutionary biologists have is to understand how the incredible diversity of organisms that inhabit our planet originated and how this biodiversity is maintained. Before we can address this goal though, we need a way to name, identify, and classify all of this biodiversity into more or less distinct entities known as species. Many of us learned in our biology courses that species are defined as groups of actually or potentially interbreeding organisms that are reproductively isolated from other interbreeding groups. Um, so for centuries, the way in which we would attempt to identify such groups would be to go out into the field. Sorry, my slides are a little bit behind. Um, the way we would attempt to identify such groups would be to go out into the field and collect the organisms that we encountered there. We would then compare their morphology, that is the way that they look, their physical characteristics. So we might count up the number of gill rakers or the number of dorsal fin spines. And these morphological differences would be taken as evidence of reproductive isolation among organisms. Then these morphologically distinct sets of organisms would be formally named and described in monographs or journal articles that would then be accessible to scientists and naturalists across the globe. On the whole, this process remains central to species discovery and description today. But over the course of the last century, both our conceptualization of what species are and the methods that we use to delimit and describe species have expanded significantly. First, since about the middle of the 20th century, there has been this proliferation of different species concepts that each emphasize different criteria that can be used to identify and diagnose species. For instance, the definition that I just provided to you, which emphasizes reproductive isolation, has become known as the biological species concept. Or there's the ecological species concept, which emphasizes ecological differences between species, such as what they eat. This diversity of concepts and criteria means that we might end up with multiple conflicting hypotheses regarding the number of species around us and the ways in which they're distinguished from each other. But it is possible for us to reconcile all of these different species concepts within a single framework. A general lineage concept of species was born out of the recognition that despite all of these differences among concepts, they all generally agree that species can be defined broadly as separately evolving metapopulation lineages. Under this broad definition, species can be diagnosed by any one of the criteria that are emphasized by any of the other species concepts. So, for instance, in addition to the traditional morphological characters that taxonomists have been using for centuries to delimit species, we can also integrate ecological lines of evidence, or DNA sequence data. Which brings me to a second major advance of the 20th century that has had a profound influence on species delimitation, and that is molecular phylogenetics. In a nutshell, molecular phylogenetics is a discipline of using molecular data, such as DNA sequences, to infer the evolutionary relationships among sets of organisms. All species on Earth are related by descent from common ancestry, and these ancestor descendant relationships can be visualized using a branching diagram called a phylogeny. The tips on this phylogeny represent extant species or lineages, 
And as we trace back any lineages on this tree, we eventually arrive at a node that represents their most recent common ancestor. A group of organisms that encompass a given common ancestor and all of its descendants, such as the group indicated here, is called a monophyletic group or a clade. And monophyly is a really important criterion that can be used to diagnose species under the phylogenetic species concept. For a long time, phylogenetic relationships were primarily inferred by comparing morphological traits among organisms. Um, and so we might identify some shared character states among sets of organisms and use these as evidence for common ancestry. But technological advances in the 20th century have now made it possible for us to collect genetic information from these organisms and use this data to infer evolutionary relationships. In many cases, the application of molecular data has built confidence in our hypotheses about relationships and species boundaries using morphology. But in other cases, molecular data have actually resulted in the discovery of species diversity that went previously undetected on the basis of morphology alone. And this illustrates that it's really important for us to have an integrated approach to species delimitation in which multiple lines of evidence such as molecular data, morphological data, or ecological data are brought to bear on questions of species delimitation. A highly integrative approach for species delimitation is of particular importance for understanding the processes that generated and maintained Antarctic marine biodiversity. So the Antarctic continental shelf kind of functions as a closed basin. It's a very extreme environment and very remote, isolated from other marine habitats in the world by long geographic distances, a fast flowing circumpolar current, and water temperatures that reach as low as negative 1.86 degrees Celsius. Despite these seemingly inhospitable conditions, Antarctica's Southern Ocean is home to a diverse fish fauna that's dominated by a single group known as the Antarctic Notothenoids. So you have actually maybe personally encountered a notothenoid if you've ever eaten Chilean sea bass, uh, the common name of which is Patagonian toothfish, which is a lot less appetizing. Um, or you may have heard of a clade within the notothenoids called the ice fishes, which are unique among all vertebrates in that they lack hemoglobin and red blood cells, rendering their blood white or clear, as you can see in the vial here. Today, notothenoids comprise 91% of the biomass, 92% of the species abundance, and 76% of the species diversity of the Antarctic fish fauna. But that wasn't always the case. And that's because Antarctica wasn't always this frozen desert that we think of it as today. So a little over 40 million years ago, the Antarctic continental shelf was considerably warmer and was home to actually more of a temperate fauna that's not very different from what we might find out in the Long Island Sound. But with the onset of polar conditions in the Oligocene, non-cold adapted fishes were literally frozen out and the notothenoids armed with antifreeze proteins that prevent their bodily fluids from freezing in sub-zero temperatures, were allowed to diversify into the more than 80 morphologically and ecologically diverse species that dominate the region today. A deeper understanding of how this diversity evolved in this extreme environment depends on an accurate account of notothenoid species diversity but there is currently pervasive uncertainty in the total number of notothenoid species and the boundaries among them. So for instance, on the one hand, recent application of genetic data to species delimitation in notothenoids has revealed a few cases where um, genetically distinct species are not very morphologically distinct from each other. So for instance, the elephant rock cod that's pictured here um, was recently found to harbor two genetically distinct species, despite being pretty morphologically similar. On the other hand, there are a few notothenoid species that have been delimited on the basis of a small number of specimens, as well as, as a small number of morphological traits of unknown utility, as has been the case for the ice fish genus Canichthys. So here I'm showing you a photo of three different Canichthys species, but systematists debate whether this lineage includes between one or up to nine different species. But nowhere is the rate of species description higher than in the Antarctic barbled plunderfishes. So the plunderfish genus Paganoprimi currently comprises 29 valid species, 13 of which were described since the start of the 21st century, and 14 of which are known only from the set of specimens that were used to describe those species, also known as the type series. Paganoprimi species diversity is currently classified into five different species groups based on differences in modeling patterns. So we have an unspotted group, we have three spotted groups, and we have one group that just lacks spots on the top of the head. And then the three spotted groups can be further distinguished by 
craniofacial osteological characters, such as a very steeply sloping sound. Within each of these species groups, however, species are distinguished primarily by variation in the mental organ, a structure which projects from the lower jaw. Um, there appears to be a lot of variation in sort of the, the tip of the barbel, so it can range from short and tapered to long and covered in many different kinds of folds and projections. But interestingly enough, this photo, these photos that I've just shown you actually represent the range of variation of the mental barbel within a single species, Pagonophrenes scotti. And this suggests that there's, there seems to be a lot of within species variation and a trait that we're using to try to distinguish among these species. Furthermore, a previous study of the phylogenetic relationships within Paganophrynae using molecular data um, revealed that while each of the five currently recognized species groups is strongly supported as monophyletic, that is, they represent independently evolving lineages, the species that are currently recognized within each group are not monophyletic. So high within species variation in a character that's used to delimit species boundaries, as well as a lack of genetic differentiation among those species, Back the question, how many species of Paganophrynae are actually out there? To look at this, we took an integrative approach to the limit species um, by bringing together both morphological and molecular lines of evidence. So starting with the molecular analyses, over the course of multiple austral summers, my co-authors and I on one trip were able to travel down to Antarctica and we collected 218 fish specimens representing 18 of the 29 currently recognized species. So as I mentioned earlier, some species are only known from the type series, and so tissue samples were unavailable to us for 11 species. Um, but we still have coverage of all five currently recognized species groups. And our data set still represents one of the most comprehensively sampled um, molecular data sets for Paganophrynae to date. So from these 218 fish individuals, we took muscle tissue samples. We extracted DNA from those tissues. And then we sequenced over 60,000 genes from across their genomes. We then compared this genetic information across our samples to infer the phylogenetic relationships among them. And what we found is pretty similar to the results of that other molecular study that I mentioned. So we find that each of the five traditionally defined Paganophrenia species groups is monophyletic. That is, we have strong evidence from molecular data that these five species groups are following their own independent evolutionary trajectories. Interestingly, the phylogenetic analyses also identified evidence of a sixth independently evolving lineage comprising seven individuals that cannot be sorted into any of the other five currently recognized species groups. And we treat this as a putatively new species of monophrenia. Within each of the five species groups, however, we do not find monophyly of any of the species that have been defined on the basis of barbal morphology. So let's take a closer look at the Mentella group to illustrate this. So the Mentella group is currently defined to include 15 Paganophrynae species, 10 of which are sampled in our study and are differentiated in this figure by different shades of blue. As you can see by the fact that tip labels of the same color do not group together, um, there is no evidence that individuals that have been identified to the same species on the basis of morphology are monophyletic. These results suggest that the currently recognized species groups may not in fact be groups, but rather may instead represent individual species. To complement our phylogenetic analyses, we also use a non-phylogenetic approach to look at genetic variation in our data set. Specifically, we used a clustering algorithm to infer the number of genetically distinct clusters within our data set and to assign individuals to, our data, to each of these clusters. So these plots consist of vertical bars, each representing an individual. And um, the bars are shaded according to the probability that that particular sample belongs to that particular cluster. Our analyses identified six genotypic clusters within Paganophrynae, corresponding to distinctions among all of the five currently recognized species groups and that putatively new species that we identified in the phylogeny. And while nearly all samples are assigned to their respective clusters with pretty high probability, you can see that individuals identified to the Albopinus species group appear initially to exhibit mixed ancestry with the light blue mantella and dark blue monomata clusters. However, we ran nested structure analyses within three groups of individuals in our data set that represent clean splits between non-mixed clusters. And when we did this, we actually find pretty clear distinctions among the Marmorata, Albopina, and Mantella groups. <clears throat> 
we again ran nested analyses within each of the Pagonophrenes scotti, Barsicovi, and Mantella groups to see if there was any evidence of genetic substructure associated with morphologically delimited species in each group. However, similar to the phylogenetic analyses, we find no further patterns of substructure associated with species level diversity in the Barsicovi or Mantella groups. And in the Scotti group, which really only includes one species, we again found no genetic substructure, even if we tried to um, look to see if there was substructure associated with geographically isolated populations. Next, we wanted to incorporate some morphological analyses. Um, and so we collected morphological data from over 200 specimens of Pagonophrynae, many of which are housed right here at the Yale Peabody Museum. We first collected data on 26 linear morphometric characters, which essentially just refers to a set of linear measurements such as head length or body depth, which capture important aspects of body shape and size in these fishes. We additionally analyzed five moristic characters, which are basically just characters that you can count, um, such as the number of dorsal fin or pectoral fin rays. In order to analyze morphological differences among the six Pagonophrenia species we delimited, we first used a principal components analysis to identify what are the most important axes of morphological variation in our data set as a whole, so across all of those Pagonophrenia individuals. And we did this independently for both the linear morphometric and the moristic data sets. So for the linear morphometric data set, the two most important axes of variation in body shape were uh, variation in the head length and body depth. We generated a biplot of these two axes of variation and then plotted individuals in this morphological space that was generated. So in this plot that you're looking at, each point represents an individual fish and each point is colored according to membership of that individual to a particular species that we delimited in the morphological analyses. As you can see here, there's really no separation in the morphological space among any of the six genetically distinct species, indicating a really high degree of overlap among all six of these species in aspects of body shape and size. However, we did look at one linear measurement in isolation, that of lower jaw length relative to the entire body length of the specimen. And interestingly, we found that the putatively new species exhibits a proportionally longer lower jaw in relation to standard length compared with all other Pagonophrynae species. So this species is not only genetically distinct, but also morphologically distinct. We also found significant differences among delimited species in certain moristic traits. So here you can see that Pagonophrynae scotti exhibits a significantly lower mean number of second dorsal fin rays. Um, and this is apparent from a separation of our Pagonophrynae scotti individuals from all other Pagonophrynae species along the x-axis of this morphospace. Pagonophrynae scotti also exhibits a lower mean number of caudal vertebrae than all other Pagonophrynae species. So caudal vertebrae you can see are indicated in the top left uh, photo of the slide. Pagonophrynae marmorata exhibits significantly fewer pectoral fin rays compared with all other Pagonophrynae species. And Pagonophrynae mantella exhibits a significantly higher number of abdominal vertebrae. So while Pagonophrynae species seem to largely overlap in aspects of body shape and size, they uh, can be clearly diagnosed by several key moristic characters, in addition to the differences in pigmentation patterns and craniofacial osteological characters that have previously been used to distinguish among them. So collectively, the results of our molecular and morphological analyses support the recognition of no more than six species of Pagonophrynae, and this constitutes a really dramatic reduction from the 29 species that have been currently recognized. These species correspond to the nominal species of each of the five previously recognized species groups, in addition to one putative new species. These findings suggest that mental barbel variation is likely an unreliable character for species diagnosis and description in Pagonophrynae. And that's not entirely unsurprising. Um, I kind of mentioned this earlier in the talk, but in a previous study of morphological variation within the species or within the Pagonophrynae scotti species group, um, it was found that differences in the barbel morphology that were initially used to define two other species in the, in the Scotti group um, didn't really represent distinct barbel types, but rather just, you know, represented the range of variation in the barbel morphology within Pagonophrynae Scotti. 
And this conclusion resulted in the synonymization of two species with Pagonobrani scotti. Our findings similarly suggest that the other four currently recognized species groups have been oversplit on the basis of variation in mental barbell morphology. And we propose to synonymize 24 species of Pagonobrani with the five nominal species of each currently recognized species group. This is a pretty remarkable finding because for the most part, the application of genetic data to species limitation has either confirmed species limitation hypotheses on the basis of morphology, or these studies have identified genetically distinct species that were previously undetected and undescribed as a result of their lack of morphological differentiation. Our work joins only a handful of studies that have used molecular data to support recognition of less species diversity than has previously been recognized on the basis of morphology alone. So basically our findings really illustrate the importance of using an integrative approach to species limitation because we demonstrate how the integration of molecular and morphological data can, shed, can simultaneously shed light on both the overestimation of species diversity and also shed light on the discovery of new species. But why does any of this matter beyond just providing a clarification of the taxonomy of a relatively small group of fishes? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, our understanding of how life has evolved across our planet hinges critically on accurate species limitations. Specifically, if we have inaccuracies in our estimated number of species and the boundaries among them, this is sure to significantly bias our estimates of phylogenetic relationships, our estimates of the timing at which species diverge from one another, and our hypotheses about the historical processes that may have generated this diversity. Our clarification of species boundaries and phylogenetic relationships within Pagonophrynae are critical for future investigations of the processes that generate diversity in the Antarctic. So Pagonophrynae began diversifying about a little over a million years ago during the Pleistocene, an epoch that's been characterized by really frequent climatic fluctuations that are associated with repeated cycles of glacial advance and retreat. Our strongly supported hypothesis of Pagonophrynae species and relationships will lend greater confidence to future investigations of how these glacial cycles have influenced diversification of noted Inuits. In turn, understanding how climatic and geologic processes influence diversification in the Antarctic may provide crucial insights into a recent finding that the rates of species diversification, species generation, yes, yeah, species diversification in marine fishes are higher in the polar regions of our planet than anywhere else on Earth. Indeed, notothenuates exhibit uh, exceptionally high species nation weights compared with all other marine fishes. And so understanding how these fishes, how the notothenuates evolved in the context of the geologic and climatic history of Antarctica will have important implications for our understanding of what's driving this really interesting global pattern of variation in speciation rate in marine fishes. Finally, accurate estimates of species numbers and species boundaries are, of course, important for present and future conservation efforts. The impacts of human-induced climate change can already be seen in warming temperatures of Antarctica, increased ice shelf melt, and changes in ocean circulation. And these changes are projected to reduce the amount of suitable habitat for a group of fishes that are really highly adapted to a really narrow range of environmental conditions. So being able to integrate evidence from a wide array of data types to accurately name and distinguish among all of the species that inhabit our planet is a crucial goal in our efforts to conserve this biodiversity. With that, I would like to thank the co-authors and collaborators on this uh, paper, especially my advisor, Dr. Tom Muir. I'd also like to thank museum support, especially here at the Yale Peabody Museum and especially Greg Watkins Colwell. Um, I'd like to acknowledge field and laboratory support and funding sources. And with that, I can take any questions. That was a really great talk. Um, I wanted to ask you one first question from an audience member named Adrian, who asked, what is the purpose of the mental barble? And I was wondering if it was used to do something like learn and pray or um, like angler fish or something like that. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so it's a little bit unclear. It most likely functions in feeding, probably as a lure, maybe as a somatosensory organ or potentially both. Um, there have been some experiments that have shown, I think, some 
uh, fishes that are related to pagonophrynae and maybe even pagonophrynae kind of moving the barbel in a way that suggests that it could act as a lure. Um, so yeah, that seems to be the consensus is that in general, it functions in feeding probably. Great. Uh, we also have a follow-up question from Ray that asks, if is the shape or length driven by selection for food type, substrate type, or sexual selection? And are there regional patterns in barbell shape within single species that may show incipient speciation happening? That's a great question. That's something that we've thought about. Um, so it doesn't really seem like there's any sort of regional variation in barbell appearance or length um, within the Paganophrynae scotti, you know, group, that's not really a group anymore. Um, there, there have been studies that try to look at some of these associations, but um, there don't appear to be any sexual selection related differences. Um, there seems to be maybe some kind of pattern of variation in the barbel with the body size of the specimens, but it's unclear how that holds up across all of these other species groups. That's actually something that we would like to look at in the future. Um, but yeah, so far, I don't think there's any evidence of it varying with a uh, prey type, but you know, I, I don't know if that's been explicitly looked at. Okay, thanks. That was really interesting. Um, I had another question about um, some of the fish that you've sampled. So mm -hmm. I was wondering whether your tissue samples were from museum specimens, live fish, or both. Yeah, so um, basically all of the tissue samples are at some point collected from live specimens in Antarctica. A lot of the ones that we used um, were collected by Tom or our other, um, Tom Muir, my advisor, or um, some of the other collaborators on this project. And we, uh, I used basically tissue samples that had been collected on previous expeditions that are housed here at the Peabody Museum. And we also were gifted some tissue samples from uh, the Tapapa Museum of New Zealand. Okay, awesome, really interesting. Um, we have a question from an audience member, Teresa, who says, great job, where can we read more about this team research? Yeah, so um, this a paper based on this work was actually published in the journal Systematic Biology um, mm -hmm. earlier this year. So there you can find more information. Um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. And congratulations on your publication. Thank you. Um, and then there's Elsa who says, great talk, are the relative amounts of genetic diversity within the species correlated at all with the amount of morphological diversity within them? That's a really great question. So um, this isn't something that we explicitly looked at in the study. Um, I will say that on the whole, it, it kind of seems like they are somewhat correlated because we we don't have a lot of genetic diversity within each of the species that we delimit. And as you can kind of see from our morphological analyses, we also are not really seeing a ton of morphological separation among the species that we delimit in terms of, you know, things like, um, yeah, like those linear morphometric characters that I mentioned or the meristic characters. Um, but yeah, it's not something that we explicitly tested here. Okay, gotcha. Um, there's another question from Richard who asks, how long did it take to define the gene structure of each fish? Wow. Um, so in order to get the genetic information, um, yeah, because we had like 60,000 genes that we looked at. Awesome. Um, basically, it, um, you know, involves doing some library preparation in the lab for a couple of weeks. Um, then we typically are essentially cutting up the DNA, right? And then we're amplifying the DNA and uh, we're specifically kind of targeting certain regions of the DNA and then we send it off for sequencing. Um, that usually takes a couple more weeks. Um, so on the whole, it takes about like, hopefully you're looking at like a month or two, hopefully not much longer than that to get the genetic data back. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and I was wondering a little bit about the morphometric characters that you chose. So um, how did you go about selecting those? Uh, were they all external or were there any like internal anatomical characters that you looked at as well? Yeah, that's great. Um, so we did not look at any internal anatomical characters. Um, well, actually that's not, so we did perform some x-rays actually to get the but this isn't really like an internal character, but um, we did kind of look at some of the osteology of these fishes. 
um, and that's how we got the um, lower jaw measurements that were used to basically uh, morphologically distinguish that putative meaning species. Um, but for the most part, all measurements were taken um, externally from these fishes. Um, and we chose the characters that we looked at in part just because it's these are the set of characters that have been historically looked at in other studies. So we could kind of put our results in the context of some of these previous papers. But in general, these characters are kind of chosen to ideally highlight some of those important aspects of variation in morphology of fishes in general. So body depth is typically a pretty important axis of variation. Um, head length also, those two major axes that we identified are pretty major axes of variation. So um, that's how those characters kind of get identified too. Okay, thank you. Um, and then at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned um, some of the different species concepts, like there was an evolutionary one, there's an ecological one. And I was wondering, is um, there a way for the old like biological species concept to find out about the degree of reproductive isolation amongst these fish? Or is that just based more on like the geography of where they live or something like that? Yeah, so typically the way that reproductive isolation, I guess is sort of um, the evidence that we use for that sometimes can be geographic isolation. Um, with these particular fishes, right? Um, they all exhibit pretty widespread sort of circumantarctic distributions. So there's really not a lot of geographic, and even the six species that we delimited uh, kind of overlap in terms of their distribution as well as um, you know along a depth gradient. There's a little bit of separation, but not a ton. Um, and so you know in this particular case, uh, we are using um, genetics and morphology to kind of get a sense of whether or not there is reproductive isolation. And you know some in some groups you can kind of actually look. You can use experimental evidence to see like if organisms actually are or not reproducing, but we couldn't, you know, do that here. So, right. Okay. So, what would what would that type of experiment like? Is that something that you would do like in the Arctic, and then how would you like separate the fish? Yeah, that's honestly that's a great question. It's not something that I personally have experience oh, okay. with, so I'm not totally sure how you would go about that. But yeah, you can't really transport uh, the live fishes here super easily, so. Ideally, you would have them in tanks down in Antarctica at a field. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it'd be sort of like an in situ experiment that you would do yeah. in the field. Okay. That'd be really cool. Um, I had another question um, just about sort of like the broad overarching results that you found, which you said were, you know, really different from basically what a lot of other people have found when you could compare the morphological characteristics and then the molecular data to look at sort of species and phylogenies. And so you said there were a lot more examples, I think of like more species being found or basically the evidence from the molecular data will confirm like the morphological um, characteristics that sort of um, scientists in the field have been using. But I was wondering if there are other examples from like different taxa where the molecular data suggests a smaller number of species like, like you found. And if so, like what kind of taxa or like where would those, um, where would those taxa be found? Yeah, so um, there are a couple of great examples that spring to mind. Um, so one of them is heliconius butterflies. Um, there was a recent mm -hmm. study that found fewer diversity in that group that had been um, recognized on the basis of genetic data versus morphological. Um, another great example is um, there were some plants in Madagascar um, that it, it's a very kind of parallel case of, you know, about 20 to 30 species having been described um, on, the case, on the basis of a pretty small number of specimens. And that diversity was also reduced to, I think, about like five or six species on the basis of molecular data. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, obviously the geographic distributions are pretty different. One is a little bit more widespread, one's a little bit more, you know, contained to Madagascar. Um, but yeah, what's a really interesting parallel across all of these three different studies, uh, ours included, is that it seems that uh, these morphological differences were, um, you know, basically uh, identified on the basis of a pretty small number of specimens. Um, and those species continued to be known from a relatively small number of specimens. Okay. 
Um, yeah. Okay, that's and and the morphological characters. There's obviously some subjectivity in the morphological characters that we can use to distinguish among species. That seems to be a little bit the case, maybe in Pagana Friday. Um, and you know, as you collect more data, whether it's more morphological data or um, it, so that was something that's kind of interesting about Pagana Friday too is that when researchers collected more morphological data on the barbel variation in that one species, Pagana Friday scotti. Uh, they basically found that instead of having sort of few distinct types, there was just like a pretty continuous range of variation in this character. Um, and so that's a case where if you're just collecting additional morphological data, you can, um, you know, kind of reevaluate your species limitation hypotheses, or in our case, obviously use the genetic data to kind of clarify this issue. Okay, cool. Really interesting. Thank you for adding that. Um, we did have another question from Edgar, who says, great job, Elise, studying such remote and unusual species clades must be difficult. Any factor in the biology of these species groups that you think needs to be explored more extensive, extensively? And if so, how would you do that? Yeah, so um, I think definitely diet and feeding behavior could be explored more extensively. Um, there is a pretty decent literature uh, when we think about once we've reduced actually the number of species, our literature for um, species specific uh, patterns of feeding um, and their ecology, um, we have a little bit, uh, we have like pretty decent information for those five species that we distinguished among. Um, but I think that's a really key um, area of biological information that we need to learn a little bit more about. Um, Right now, it kind of seems like all of these species are pretty morphologically and ecologically similar to each other. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like they're all kind of feeding on roughly the same thing, so small amphipods. And, um, you know, if we got a little bit of a better sense of the, uh, I guess, degree of variation in prey across the geographic distributions of each of these species, we might see if there's a little bit of like ecological separation among them that currently is undetected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Um, we have Richard asking another question about genes. So um, how do you select which genes to look at and where is the work done? So I don't know if that's like, you know, the extractions or the genetic stuff or maybe just everything, but yeah. 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 That's a great question. So um, the way that the genes are selected um, right now, we're kind of using these genomic scale sequencing approaches. And uh, which kind of genomic scale approach you use sort of depends on the taxonomic scale that you're looking at. So in our particular case, um, we're looking at a pretty low taxonomic level at like the genus level. Um, mm -hmm. We're looking at differences among species. So we went with a sequencing approach that would give us loci that have, or genes that have been shown to um, exhibit a little bit more variation at recent time scales which then will allow us to really tease apart the genetic differentiation at a finer scale. Okay. Um, as far as where the work is done, it's typically done in molecular labs. Um, and so from the, you know, obviously we're extracting or we're um, getting the tissue samples typically when we're out in the field and preserving them right away. Um, but the work itself, we bring those tissues back to a molecular lab and we do the DNA extraction, we do the preparation of the genomic libraries um, pretty much in those molecular labs. And then we, for the actual sequencing, sent it, our, our libraries off to a um, sequencing facility. Okay, cool. Really interesting to hear more about the process. Thanks for explaining all that. Yeah. And then um, I just had one last question for you. Um, I loved all the pictures of all the fish that you had in your presentation. And I was just wondering like what the scale is on those. I feel like sometimes, you know, fish can be really small or really huge. So can you just, yeah, give us an idea of in real life, what size they are? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I can, you know, a lot of Pagana Friendly species, they can be smaller, but some of the larger ones we've collected are like maybe about this size. So not huge uh, for scale, um, that Patagonia toothfish that I showed you earlier in the talk, um, species of uh, that genus Disosticus can you know get to like a meter in length. And so relative wow. to some of the larger Antarctic fishes, um, these are kind of a smaller to medium size, um, but there are definitely some smaller, um, even closely related to the common there are some 
some um, fishes that, you know, only get like a few inches in length, so. Gotcha, okay. Thanks so much for that. Um, yeah, I think we're done with questions. Um, and so we're about at time. Uh, I can just say thanks to everyone for being here today. I wanna plug a couple of links to our upcoming talks. So in this series, you can look forward to a talk from Ian Gilman, who's also in the EEB department. That talk will be taking place on February 9th, and Ian will be telling us about plant evolution instead of fish evolution. Um, and in the meantime, you can follow us on social media or please stay in touch by signing up for our mailing list on the website. We'd like to make sure that you're able to catch all of the upcoming online and in-person programs this semester and beyond. Um, and I just like to say thanks again to Elise for being here. It was a wonderful presentation and um, I really enjoyed it. And thank you to everyone in the audience for being here. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your Tuesday. <laughs>